first of all, I this lesson's probably more for me than anyone else because I don't know the Old Testament that way that much. I mean, I'm not real versed in the Old Testament. Of course, I've read through it and, you know, you hear Bible lessons here and there, but I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like a solid Old Testament scholar. I'm not even, you know. Anyway, so after I read through all the material Anne gave me, the next week I went to Anne and I said, Anne, I'm really not very good at the Old Testament. Maybe I have the wrong lesson. And she smiles ever so sweetly and says, no, I think the right person has that lesson, <laughs> which meant, of course, it's for me to learn. So I hope you'll gain something. I mean, I hope you'll learn something today that maybe you didn't think about before. I am sure everybody has heard a lot of this before. You've heard a lot of the, the, the whole object though is to point, the kingdom was always here. The whole object is, is, you know, explain the kingdom has always been here. God's always been in charge. He will continue to be in charge. Yes. And the Old Testament points to the New Testament. And the Old Testament points to Christ coming. And when he comes, you know, the church will be part of the kingdom. But the church is part of the kingdom, but the kingdom is bigger than the church because the kingdom has always been here and God's always been in charge. Anyway, so I'm going to take you through some of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, we're going to talk about the theocratic kingdom, which I had to look up the definition of theocratic. It's divine guidance, which God is in charge. And this is more, I thought when I, when I was doing this, I was thinking, it's like the theocratic is when God was talking kind of directly to people, like he talked to Abraham and Moses and Joshua. He led them, but he was more, it was more like a direct contact, and he was in charge. Of course, he's always been in charge. Then the monarchy period is when he used kings to rule. So, you know, he kind of ruled through Moses and Joshua in the theocratic period. In the monarchy period, he used the kings. And then... We have the period, and that was Saul, David, Solomon. And then we have the period of, of the exile when the Israelites were, you know, exiled. And they kind of were exiled from God in a way. He, he really was mad and he was punishing them. And he kind of went away from them for a while. But that was his plan. His plan was all along, keep Judah separate. See, and I didn't know, I didn't know a lot about a lot of things. And every time I would study something a little bit, I would say, hey, what about this? The funny thing is that last Sunday, while Eddie was doing a sermon, he's put up that map, right? And I'm thinking, you know, one of my first questions after like a week or two, and I went to, to um, not Dale, um, Dewey, and said, how does, how does Nebuchadnezzar fit in this? You know, because he was in my notes. Because most of this stuff came from Jim McWiggin. Um, if you know him, I listen to some of his YouTube and I have his outline and he's written a book about the kingdom. So if you're interested in learning more, for every scripture I have one of, he probably had four or five of. I just used like one to make a point. He has a ton of scriptures to make his points. And a lot of his, his a lot of what I'm saying is probably from him. Um, but anyway, so I went to Dewey and I said, so how does Nebuchadnezzar fit in this? Then the interesting thing, you know, and he told me, he told me about the Assyrian captivity and then the Babylonian captivity and then how Nebuchadnezzar was the king over the Babylonians. And because, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was mentioned in the notes. So then while Eddie was doing a sermon last week, I was thinking when he put up that map, I was thinking, I'll bet that's where the Babylonian empire was right between those two rivers and stuff. And I'm thinking in my mind about this and I'm thinking, a month ago, I would have never even thought of where was the Babylonian Empire. And all of a sudden, this, I see this map, and I'm like thinking, is that where the Babylonian Empire is? So when I say something, if, you, if I get it wrong, for instance, I kept coming up with questions. The more I studied, the more questions I came. When I was dividing this into the theocratic, the monarchy, and the exile, I was kind of thinking God talked to Abraham, Moses, and Joshua. God didn't talk directly to the kings, but I'm, but I'm thinking, I don't remember him talking directly to David. Did he talk to David? Does someone know if he talked directly to David or was it all through the prophets? Anybody know the answer to that question? I hear I was counting on somebody to know the answer. Anyway, so I'm, I'm assuming, I'm thinking that he did not. I'm thinking he 
he, you know, he, he made him king through the prophets. And then maybe you know as much as the Old Testament as I do, which makes me feel a little better. So you can know I'm going to stumble through this. Anyway, as I, as I went, more questions arose. So I hope I have it. So we'll, we'll get started here. So first, we start with Adam and Eve. He gave them authority. He gave them dominion over all the animals. So it was God's to start, start with. It's always been God's. But he gave it to Adam and Eve. Um, so I have three scriptures about he's our true God, our living God, the eternal God. That's Jeremiah 10.10. 10. And then in Psalms, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. So because Jim McGuigan brings up the flood, how God was in charge of that. Well, God's in charge of everything. You know, he was in charge of, you know, what happened with Noah and the flood and, the, and Jonah and everything. You know, he's in charge of everything. But we have to go through the scriptures and I have to try to bring something to light. And then uh, the third scripture there was the Lord reigns forever and ever. Exodus 15, 18. Well, there's a lot of scriptures that say the Lord reigns forever and ever but I just picked out these few. So God's plan, his original plan, was to bless the world through the covenant made with Abraham and his seed, the, the Jews. And those would be... So then in Genesis 12, 1, 3, we have the Lord had said to Abram, Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then, um, so Israel, the nation of Israel, was kind of already under God's dominion before they became a nation. So then, then when the Mosaic, so, so Jimmy Guigan calls it the Abrahamic covenant that he made with Abraham. And then... When he, when he went with Moses to make the Mosaic covenant, he calls it a Mosaic covenant. There are two different covenants. The Abraham covenant was with Abraham, and he was going to bless Abraham and his seed. And that's where Jesus comes from originally. And then the Mosaic covenant comes in. Well, the Mosaic covenant is a different covenant because it's with the nation of Israel. But it's not. It's different, but yet he used the Mosaic covenant to push on the Abraham covenant. In other words, I don't, I don't know. In other words, anyway, so he makes a, he makes the covenant with Israel, with Israel, with Moses. Um, oh, this is the Abraham, Abram's covenant. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give you this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, which on Eddie's map last week, it had there the Canaan, the land of the Canaan. And that was the promised land. That's what made me think, I wonder if all that spark, you know, how he did the journey. Um, that's what made me think of that. Anyway, so the next scripture is Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, this is the covenant with, the, with Moses. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. He called him his treasured possession. So it was a special relationship that he had with Israel. And they, at Mount Sinai is when it gets formalized. And he says, if you do what I tell you. Well, they agree. They said, when Moses went and told all the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice and they said, everything the Lord the Lord has said, we will do. Well, that didn't last too long, but they did agree to begin with. So then later on, of course, they, get, they ended up getting punished. So the Mosaic, Mosaic Covenant was with the nation. Oh, I said that already. Um, and they were independent of each other. They, Moses and Joshua only needed to enforce the rules that God set up with, you know, with the uh, Ten Commandments and everything. So the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us and you, your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. It's almost like the people even back then wanted a king. They wanted Gideon to take over. And I think this is 
Joshua or one of the judges saying, you know, the Lord is ruling over you. All we have to do is follow what the Lord says. But it's almost like <laughs> we want Gideon to rule over us. It's almost like they want to make up. They want to, they want to be in charge like we do sometimes. Um, despite the fact that during this period, there was no kingly representative. It was always God's intention to give Israel king, even, even though there was no king right then. Genesis 35, 11 says, and God said to them, I am God almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. Um, so he already recognizes what, way back in Genesis that there's going to be kings. So God always intended for there to be kings, even though at the beginning there wasn't kings. Just like he knows what's going on right now. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows what's going to go on with the presidency. He knows what's going to go on with this COVID thing. He knows everything is going to go on. I always find that amazing that he can tell the future. And that he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But yet we have a choice. We have a choice to choose. Just like, you know, and well, I just did that Bible class for the kids with Nineveh and Jonah and stuff. He, he knew that Nineveh was probably going to repent. But yet he had put Jonah through the whole thing because he always has a purpose, always has a point. So during the pre-monarchy monarchy period, we have God ruling over all the nations through kings and leaders and through various kings. In fact, you know, like all the nations. So he's not just ruling over Israel. He's ruling over everyone around Israel, even through different pharaohs. And um, he's got Amaphels, Titles, Beerus, whatever they are. And then he ruled Israel as their sole king. His relationship with Israel was a lot different than the other nations because it was more, he was, you know, because they were, they were special nation. And he, he expected, I think he expected more from them too, because he had a special agreement with them and he treated them special. Israel's an example. Israel is an example of the relationship that he would like to have with all the creation. We're his by creation, but he wants us to submit to him by choice. You know, how they submitted to by choice. He wants us to choose to submit. And that's where, you know, that kind of goes forward too in the New Testament where we choose to submit to Christ. We choose to be part of his family. We choose, we choose that. Exodus 19, 5 through 8. The people all responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. Oh, I said this one already, but I thought it was important to redo it. And after Moses and Joshua died, strong leadership vanished and anarchy set in. And then we have a record of uh, like there were priests and there were priests that were leaders. And then that's when Samuel becomes real popular, you know, and he's one of the people, he's one of the leaders then. However, he wasn't like the king and he wasn't. He didn't rule over everybody, but there were, you know, so there was some order because Samuel, the prophet Samuel was um, bringing God's words to people, but it was, it was kind of chaos. And then Samuel's sons and Eli's sons kind of, that was the, that was the point where the people said, give us a king because they, they felt like, you know, Samuel was getting old. They felt like they didn't have a leader. They felt like they needed a king. The other nations all had kings. They wanted a king. Samuel says, no, you don't want a king. If you have a king, he's going to take your sons, make them work for him. He's going to charge your taxes. You know, having a king isn't so great. But the people kept saying they wanted to have a king. So God said, Samuel, even though Samuel was against it, God said, um, this is Judges 17, 6. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. And then on, um, and then it said, um, 1 Samuel 8, 21 through 22. When Samuel heard all the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. And so they wanted a visible representative. So they wanted a king. Um, then, so that's when the monarchy starts. So Samuel ends up anointing Saul as king. Um, Saul, 
Saul was kind of like an interim king. The, and this is something I looked up because Saul didn't come from the tribe of, ben, of Judah. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. I didn't know that before. So I was like, huh. Okay, so, so even when Saul made him king, I mean, when God told Samuel to make Saul king, he knew that it was only going to be a temporary arrangement. His whole plan was to have David be the king, David from the line of Judah. But Samuel, you know, kind of loved Saul. Samuel, Samuel kind of got attached to Saul. So did David for that matter. But, you know, then God came and Saul's kind of, it's kind of sad because then God came in. He had his own plan and hardened got Saul's heart and, you know, everything changed. But Saul was king for like 40 years. So I suppose in that time, David had to grow up. You know, so there, there was that time frame, and that's what and that that's what my daughter pointed out to me. I said, "I wonder why he just didn't make David king to start with." And and my my daughter says, "Mommy probably wasn't old enough yet." So that was what, and that was something else that you know we we discovered in our process. So then we have then he he made David king next, and he made the covenant with David. Um. Let's see. This is 1 Samuel 16.1. Maybe. 11. Yeah. And yeah. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. And then we skip to verse 11. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Even though the people now, they had a visible king. Um, still God was in charge you know they had a king but God was still the one strictly speaking that was in charge now let's see he was working with David to rule the Israelites and David even acknowledges that God is the one that's his king and this is first chronicles 29 10 through 13 David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying praise be to you Lord the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So, David acknowledged openly that God was that God was the one in charge not him but it's interesting too this was um the throne in the bible they interchanged the throne of David the throne of Solomon the throne of God the kingdom of David the kingdom of Judah the kingdom of God these are kind of interchangeable and I have some scriptures to do with that so of all my sons uh, this is first chronicles 28 5 and the Lord has given me many. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And then this is when Mark 11:10, blessed is the king coming kingdom of our father David. So they even call in the New Testament, they're calling it the kingdom of David, but it's the kingdom of God. And then um, in Second Chronicles, and now you plan to resist the kingdom of the Lord, which is the hands of David's descendants. So anyway, that was kind of interesting to me about how they interchange all of this the kingdom of god over israel now involved royalty embracing the human and the divine that was david and jehovah what does that remind you of human divine human divine christ you know embracing the human and the divine so it was kind of like foretelling and that is daniel 7 13 and 14 in my vision at night i looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
Um, and this, let's see. That's the prediction of Christ's coming, that kingdom that's never going to be destroyed. Now then, when, when Solomon was king, I thought this was interesting. Okay, when Solomon was king, um, he had all these he had all these wives that were his downfall. But he was really trying to do a good thing. He married all these people, all these he had all these wives because he was trying to make make peace with all the different nations. So he had all these wives that he brought in, and he was he you know they brought in their gods, and that's you know kind of led to Solomon's downfall. They brought in all their idols and their doll, uh, and their and stuff. But origi originally, the plan was Solomon was trying to be a good king. He was trying to make peace with other nations by marrying into the other, you know, nations. Anyway, so then when the Queen of Sheba visits Solomon, she recognizes that God is the one in control, not Solomon. She says, "Praise be." This is from this is from the Queen of Sheba. She says, "Praise be to the Lord your God." who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as king to rule for the Lord your God. Because of the love of your God for Israel and his desire to uphold them forever, he has made you king over them to maintain justice and righteousness. And, you know, we've all heard the stories about how Solomon was so wise and everything. You know, all that, all that, but God was really the one in charge. God gave him the power. The universal kingdom is much wider than the David the Davidic kingdom because God's still in charge of the rest of the world too. It isn't just Israel. The day would come when the power exercised on the throne of David would be as wide as the universal sovereignty. So that's in Christ because that's universal. Anybody can be in Christ, which is actually from the Davidic um, covenant. Just as the Abraham covenant was independent of the, but connected with the Jewish nation and the Mosaic covenant the the, the um, Davidic covenant was independent of you know it was promised to David and his descendants it was independent of the Mosaic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant but it kind of all it all led to Jesus it all kind of combines but they're separate but yet they're, they combine. Um, that's Genesis 49.10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be of his. And then um, Psalms 110, 4-6, As the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. Now then, the next step is when the, they go into exile. And I didn't understand this completely before either about the, I knew there was, you know, the separation, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, but I didn't understand exactly why. And it, it was all because of the way they got, more and more evil. Anyway, when the kingdom divided in the northern part, and I had to study this out too because I didn't know this before. The northern part, you know, the, the, ten, the ten northern tribes were under um, Jeroboam. And then Judah and Israel stayed under Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon. But the nation started getting more and more evil. Um, you know, until they went into Assyrian captivity, and then they went, and then the B Babylonian Empire kind of gobbled them up or took over. And that's in First Kings eleven thirty one through forty. Then he said to Jeroboam, to "Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says: See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes." But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. But doesn't he have two? Oh, he means just the tribe of Judah. But Judah and Benjamin were the southern tribes. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the 
Sidonians, Shemesh, the god, of, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in obedience to me or done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my decrees and laws as David's own father did. Then he said to Jeroboam, oh, I already read that. Okay. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. Uh-oh. I need help. Anyway, I think I can go on with that. without that. You can you can keep you can see if you can get that to work. I'll just go on. Um this so then God was ruling the nations with foreigners after that. After they got, you know, like the Nebuchadnezzar guy. He was ruling the north and first it was the north and south separate, and then it was everybody the north and the Syrian captivity, and then it was everybody underneath the Babylonian Empire, and there were foreigners that were in charge. But you know, still there was people that remained faithful. Thank you, Joe. Um, to you know, and Judah was kind of kept a little bit separate because they knew the history and they know Jesus came, you know, we have all that begats and all that stuff and and they know that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So okay, so I'm going to skip all this and then I'm going to go down to Nebuchadnezzar. I thought this was interesting too when I was reading about Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you know he has a dream and I think it's Daniel that interprets the dream and and he and he, and Nebuchadnezzar seems like he's believing in God. I mean, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, the, up there at the top. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. And that's, you know, when he had the dream and Daniel interpreted it. And then he, you know, and then he throws Shadrach, Meshach in the oven and all that stuff, and they come out. You would think, wouldn't you think, he knew God was God. I mean, you would think he saw them not get burned, that he would know. But not, not very long after that, in Daniel 4, he says, is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence? I mean, by, the, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? He, gets, he goes from knowing this, but then we do the same thing sometimes, I guess. He goes from knowing God is God, and Daniel interpreting his dreams, he had a couple of them. And then he goes and he gives himself all the credit. Anyway, God didn't like that too much. And then, you know, the story about him, you know, grazing like an animal for seven years and all that stuff. Well, and that, um, okay, so then, let's get over to, so then this is, you know, that was like, after Daniel interpreted one of his dreams, and he, he told him, you know, he told him about how he was going to, you know, he was the king, and, and he needed to repent, and he didn't repent, and then he ends up being the animal and grazing and stuff. This is at the end of that time, Daniel 4.30. He raised his eyes toward heaven, and his sanity was restored, and then he praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people, peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and exalt and glorify the God, the King of Heaven. Now, see, in this time, God's called the King of Heaven because everything He does is right, and all His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble, which He did with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the division of the kingdom and the giving of dominion over Israel to foreigners suited well the purposes of God. God uses those events to mold the world in which Jesus the King will be born. And that's Daniel 2.44. In the time of those kings, the God of the heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to the end. 
but it will itself endure forever. And they're talking about the prediction of Jesus coming and that kingdom. The kingdom by covenant promise, however, it still was rightly belonged to the Israelites, you know, because God promised it to the Israelite people. So the house of David. So God planned to have the kingdom restored to Israel at the appointed time through Jesus, the son of God and the son of David. So that was the plan all along, which we kind of know. So I don't know if I'm telling you anything new. But then I probably figure every time um, Dale gets up there, he wonders if he's telling us anything new. Psalm 89, 28 to 37. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever. This is um, uh, when he... You know, he established his life forever through David, even though he punished David and the Israelites. He still kept his promise to David because he made that promise. He still kept that promise. I like verse 33. I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. But yet they were punished. He's able. He can punish us, but he still kept his promise. Um, and then I'm going on to the exile period during which Israel would be ruled by others and the family of David was not unexpected. The prophets knew about it as early as Moses. And I'm going to give you a scripture from Hosea. Well, maybe not. Um, there we go. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So this was before. This was a uh, it predicted that. Um, the prophets, Israel, uh, let's see, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Zechariah, Joel, Joel, Joel Isaiah, they all foretell about Jesus coming. And Israel being restored through Jesus. So um, I'm going to skip those two verses too. My next point is that we need authority. God knows we need authority. Um, God established governments. Is this because this is a perfect time to tell you this? He wants us to subject ourselves to the authority figure, whoever that might be. God can work even through tyrants, you know. Um, he can work through anyone. He has a plan, our job to be obedient, and that's in Romans. Oops, maybe. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, and that's Romans 13.1. And then, Christ came as a man. And he was the man and the son of God. So he was man and divine. And the monarchy was the kind of the, the way they showed us that how that's going to work with David. So then the kingdom of God narrowed when God allowed it to be divided by Jeroboam and Rehoboam. But it didn't disappear. And then God let the foreigners have the rule. And then the kingdoms restored without the trappings of the mosaic system, you know, the priests and all that stuff. Um, the Davidic, and then the church is part of the kingdom. I'm going to say it again, but the kingdom is bigger than the church. The kingdom is wider, you know, because the kingdom has always been, and it probably always will be, but the church is part of the kingdom. So that's, that's it. That's the Old Testament part of the kingdom. And then next week, you'll hear about the New Testament part of Okay, I think I'm done.